Up next is Kevin. He's going to talk about CLIs and how to make them more something, something. Lots of coffee, not alcohol. But yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Without further ado, Kevin. Hello. Um, Hello. Just one second, sorry. Almost there. There we go. Hello. Um, I'm Kevin. Um, and I'm a little bit obsessed with CLI tools. Um, and it makes me, sometimes I, I like them, and sometimes I like the fact that when um, other people see them, um, they feel a little bit overwhelmed. Um, that's not always a bad thing. Um, sometimes the text input can feel, you know, just a bit too much. Um, there's a lot of flags and arguments and things to know and to find out. And when um, some people see it when they're new to the terminal. They can sometimes feel like it's some kind of Archean ritual that you need to perform in order to you know, get their computers to do what we want them to do. And when we open that black box um, on the computer to fix something for a family member, there's often a sense that we are seeing um, people in the code of the matrix. Um, terminal can be sometimes a little bit overwhelming. Um, when, um, when Apple made, um, oh, that's a low res image, sorry. When Apple made the CLI um, more accessible in the 80s with our Apple II, um, we got sort of the, the use of um, point and click and drag and drop and, and those kind of really clear and helpful metaphors to be able to deal with things inside of our computers, be able to get them to do things. But when we want to do something slightly more complex, um, something that requires um, maybe, um, and we want to automate it, so having small tools that we could um, compose, that can take input from one to another, that can collaborate well with each other is really, really helpful. And you're building a product um, that, um, or if you're um, trying to improve your team's workflow, having a really good CLI can be really helpful. It can be a really useful tool in your toolbox. But too often, um, our CLI tools, um, this apparently is going to be a theme, sorry, low res images. Um, too often, our, um, our CLI tools don't off get the same design user experience thinking that our graphical user um, interfaces do. Um, it's text-based, so we might be tempted not to talk to our designers about it. We might be tempted not to engage with our UX specialists. And so our features can get to our users without going through the same kind of rigorous testing and thinking as they, as they might. Um, a well-designed user interface on a terminal does lots of great things. Um, it will inform and support our users and teach them about our product. Um, it will give them guidance and help them understand better what's actually going on. It will lead them through um, the key steps, that key workflow, and help to reduce the intimidation and the overwhelm, um, and potentially increase our agency and autonomy of our users, but also get out of the way of our power users, allowing them to be automated and to be, um, to be used in, in more complex workflows. Well, all of that sounds great, but if our tool is really powerful and helpful, our users might get to understand what they're doing too well. Um, and the people who are impressed with our magic, amazing skills on the terminal might begin to realize that they could do it too. Um, maybe some of the mystic allure of our skills become demystified and, um, and understood. So I'd like to present some ways that we can intimidate and confuse our users. <laughs> Done well, we can increase their dependence on us and maintain our reputation as unapproachable geniuses. <laughs> if you put all of these into practice, people may not use your tool, but they'll be impressed that you can. So I'd like to, to present my framework on terminals against humanity. And I've got a few things to add to this toolkit. 
The first is that we refuse point blank to follow existing patterns that exist for CLI tools. So there are a few. Um, we've been building CLI tools for a long time. Michelle was showing us, um, you know, when we were writing Prolog and writing code in the 50s, we were still developing ways to interact with our terminals um, using um, text. And so we have lots of very helpful specifications that are there in order to help us do that. We could have com POSIX compliant command line argument syntax. That's like our dash A or our dash dash all when we're dealing with arguments and flags and things like that. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, we have things like standard in and standard out and standard error, where standard in might be added to by the user typing or programmatically or by from another program being piped in. Standard out may be, you know, our positive feedback and uh, the good things we want to tell our users, the key things they won't need to find out, and standard error for when things go wrong. POSIX signals, so that's things like what happens when you press Control C on the keyboard or Control D or your, or, your, or your tool receives a kill signal. What do we do with that? Well, standard practice would say that we should exit the program, maybe save the progress, maybe give some feedback. That's what we might do um, if we weren't being aggressive towards our users. Exit codes, we should um, normally exit with a zero if things went well and a non-zero of things didn't, you know, something went wrong. So we would have this way to be able to communicate with other tools in the ecosystem to say, yes, this is working, or no, there's a problem here and we need to be able to deal with it. Um, and lastly, it's nice for us to be able to accept and emit plain text or JSON in order to be able to communicate with other tools. Those are the existing patterns, none of which we want to follow. So, instead of POSIX compliant argument syntax, why not only have arguments that use three dashes instead of one or two, and only accept emojis as the possible flags? Standard in or standard out, why not swap them? <laughs> why not send all positive input to the standard error? Um, just because. Um, let's ignore POSIX signals because we know what's best. We don't need to listen to the tools that's telling the rest of the terminal that's saying we should stop. Let's just ignore that and randomly generated exit codes, brilliant. Uh, in terms of what we accept, let's only accept like a really bespoke XML that we'll craft ourselves and only emit badly formed JSON. I think that's the way forward, okay? So as we build our tools against, against humanity, as we um, do that, the first thing is that not, if not follow existing patterns. The second is to hide functionality. Now there's some tools around there that would say you should do things the other way round. That our command, our, we know that our command line tools can allow our users to have superpowers when done well. They can manipulate files, they can create servers and databases and interact with their smart lights or, or make an event on tomorrow's calendar, um, which is sometimes harder. Um, and not only that, they can combine those tools to make those sort of more complex, um, more complex workflows. Small tools can be composed to do lots of great things. And when starting to use a new tool, it's really helpful when there's a gradual unveiling, a sort of a, a led process um, without assuming what our user knows. So if you're starting a project with NPM, you might use NPM init, and we get these nice questions to lead us through that process for the first N times, and here's what that might look like. And then if you're doing a demo, and then you go NPM init dash Y, then you can get the same results back just by you know, passing that flag. A, a new user doesn't need to know that that exists, but a more experienced or someone who's done it a few times knows that exists, it gets them where they want to be straight away. Um, other tools, we might, uh, once we've initialized the project, we might then say, oh, you, did you know you can generate schemas or, or organize backups, type here, or type this in to see this, or click this link for further documentation, leading users on a journey through the functionality that's available with the tool. This really gradual revelation can help our users not get overwhelmed. It can really help to lead them in and equip them as they need it. 
Um, Angular framework has a, has a really decent um, command line utility called their ng tool, and they do some really good nested um, functionality. So the ang Angular ng generate, there's then each of the things that you would generate and you would sort of know that it's there. So having a predictable nesting functionality, knowing where things is, being able to predict that are all the things that people do when they want to give up their power to their users. We do not want to do any of these things. We instead want to hide the functionality and we want to have really useful functionality that we don't tell our users about or that we hide behind flags, maybe with three dashes, maybe something else, um, and to make sure that we, when we use the tool, look like geniuses, and when our users use the tool, they just scratch their head and wonder, how did they do that? What was going on there? Um, what's happening? So, as our terminals against humanity, we're not following system patterns, we're hiding functionality, and we're preferring positional arguments. Um, this is the, um, the man page, or the, the, the signature for the LS utility, which has up, I think, I think I counted the 43 possible flags that you can have with the LS tool. Um, you know, that's, that's, for me, that feels like a, like a crime against humanity as well, but, you know, but this is a decent tool, it has these flags, they're all short, you don't have many long, there's one long, one dash dash color, there's only short ones, you know, but you, we could pass flags to be able to help people out. And I like this overwhelming flags. And maybe some of them do the same thing, which they do. And, you know, in combination, who knows what happens. I tried, play, I tried with them all yesterday, and I just got a blank screen, which is great. That works in our crimes against our, our terminals against humanity. Um, but positional arguments um, are super handy. Um, if, we, if we want to copy something from a source file to a target file, it kind of makes sense there. But when you have more, more arguments that you might want to have, having an options-based approach where you might have the option and the value, so commit dash M and the message, and you can have other options that are there, that makes it um, our, our, our um, terminal tool really intuitive for our user. They mightn't have to look back at the documentation regularly, if there is documentation, and they might have to, and, and they could reorder what, what was there if there were multiple flags, and it would still kind of make sense. So a renaming tool might take an old file, an old name and a new name, and it wouldn't really matter which way you put them, um, the, as long as the key value pairs were, were, matched, were matched with each other. Um, but if instead we use just, um, just positional arguments, and it's particularly if we've got hundreds of possible positional arguments, then our users are never going to get it right. They're going to be led to frustration and they're going to turn to us and ask us to fix their problems for them, which is great. Um, and whichever language we use, um, there's going to be lots of parsing tools that we could, we, could, we could leverage to get this option stuff, which, you know, is nice for our users. Um, Node um, 18 has parse args and the utils libraries. You don't even have to install anything extra to be able to get this kind of thing. But positional arguments are the way forward. With them, we can overwhelm our users, make them frustrated, and again, make them think that we're geniuses. Um, so that's great. So far, so good. Our toolkit is growing. The next is to give no or way too much feedback. Now, there are some tools that do feedback really well. There are some tools that maybe give us like um, feedback or give sort of a progress bars as it's kind of working through. Docker does this really well. The speed test from Ookla does it really well. Um, where they get, we can see that something's happening particularly with something asynchronous, particularly with something that might take some time. Um, getting feedback can let our users know that, 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 they're, that when they ran the command, the computer actually listened to them and did something as well. And then there are, are there other tools that, you know, when you want to just, just fire back stuff and just give it to you. And, and you, know, it's, you know, it's a thing of beauty, isn't it? You know, so that we can over, like a user sees it and just, um, I had to half this, um, this is looping because I had, to, it was um, my, my GIF utility reckoned it was 50 megabits for four seconds. So I, um, I, I made it a bit smaller to be able to get it here. Um, so we could um, help our users and you know give them progress and 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 let them know what was happening, 
Or we could just give them a blank terminal when they ran what we were doing, and then they could control C after a few seconds because they think, oh, it didn't work, or something wasn't happening, or maybe they did it wrong. Maybe they did, but we haven't told them, and that's great too. Um, but, um, or, and, and then the feedback we could give them, you know, we could absolutely give them this beautiful feedback and, have, and be able to impress them even further when we can pick out the actual thing they need from this sort of sea of ASCII. We can say, ah, it's four slides up and you can look back there and obviously that's what you need to be able to do. How could you be so ridiculous not to know that that's where the result is? So we want to give no feedback or way too much feedback. Otherwise, our users know what they're doing um, and we'll find out what they need and maybe, um, maybe, maybe they, um, they will understand what's happening. And most, I feel like most importantly is we don't want to help them. Um, as soon as we help them, they take our power. Um, and um, you know, there are tools that have really good help. Um, and we, we, we expect that git help or git dash hits or git dash dash help you know, would give us something really helpful. And you know, what Git does wrong here is it groups together common used commands and sort of gives helpful links to where, or helpful commands you could run to get even better help relevant to what you wanted to do. So with this, they're reducing the cognitive load of the user. They're allowing them to, if they're, they're not familiar with what they're doing, um, if they kind of want to get, um, placed in sort of the world of the git command line tool. They kind of know the kind of commands they're looking for. I mean, it would be better, obviously, if they just sort of smashed all the commands together and maybe not in alphabetical order even and just sort of move them around. And maybe every time you press help, they were in a different order as well. That'd be even better, right? Um, there, there are lots of ways that we could use this as an anti-pattern and say this is definitely not what we should do. Um, and it'd be really easy to kind of kind of dig into those more. Um, and then there's things like, you know, helping with the, like the if they, there's a typo inside the, inside the command and where we say is it similar to. Um, I, I think like a message like that doesn't exist, don't be ridiculous or something, you know, insulting to the user would be helpful here to kind of turn them off using this tool more. Um, we want to, you know, how could you be so ridiculous that's not a command? Um, I think that would probably be more helpful than this kind of, oh, you could have used this command, is this what you meant? Um, other, other command line tool failures are when they might um, give you links to documentation. You're trying to do this, um, that's wrong. Here's a link to, a do to some documents that might help you improve your code or might, yeah, none of that, okay? So no help at all, don't give the help, and you know, this is what you might have do done if you were doing it wrong. And examples are another problem that people try to do, try to introduce, or another issue that people do. This is um, a fastify documentation that kind of loads it up, imports it, uses it, and declares a route to kind of get you up and running quickly as you want. So we kind of either want to go to one of two extremes. We either want no examples at all so that the users could just you know, work it out for themselves. They need to, they need to put in the effort to understand what, what, what they need to do with the tool. Examples kind of give, yeah, it's a bit like an easy path and we don't want any of that. Um, we want them to earn anything that they get w working with our tools. Um, and if we do have lots of examples, other projects might do things where they have like guides to be able to you know, dig, dive deeper into a particular thing. So if you want to look at benchmarking or databases, rather than just putting them all in one place, because that's the other option we have. Rather than giving no examples, using good syntax, well commented and all the rest of it, the alternative is to give um, too many examples, just, just blat them all onto a single page, preferably randomly sorted, maybe actually randomly sorting them on page reload as well, so that if someone finds something useful, then um, they're never gonna be able to find it again. Um, using like really um, obscure syntax is often good as well. Um, you know, you don't use, don't, I mean, maybe using one of the languages that we saw this morning as the only code samples that we might use as a way to be able to demonstrate how useful um, our command line tools can be. Um, so there's so many possibilities, I feel. Um, 
You know, I feel that, so Homer's got this little devil on his, on his side. I feel like that's, that's a role I've been playing this, this afternoon. Um, these are a toolkit that you can use to, um, to make your command line tools maintain your genius, make you seem like the, you know, the, 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 the guru, the, the magician that is going to um, be able to solve problems where other people can't. Um, most of the time, I'm the other voice, though. Um, so uh, most of the time, I do design CLIs for humans and help people design CLIs for humans. Um, I, I'm an independent JavaScript teacher. I'm a head instructor. There's a course on building CLI tools with Node on there, um, which, which, I, which I did. And um, I, run, I do a newsletter um, with a, call, a friend here, Simon Plend and I, Plendrely and I are going to be delivering a workshop on creating CLIs for humans. So if you don't want to feed um, the this guy, if you don't want to feed our devil, and you don't fancy creating CLIs like this, I think you should, you know, I think it'd be great. Um, do um, find me um, or come chat with me online or in person and we'll find out how we can do it for humans as well. But thank you for listening. Thanks, Kevin, that's awesome. Appreciate it.